Hey, Colin, how are you? Hey, Sina, how's it going? I'm very, very good, thanks. You're in sunny Colombia at the moment, right? So, out in Colombia, South America. Yep, it's all good out here. <laughs> you, are, you are our first guest who is from, well, not from, but like is living in um, South America, I believe. Yeah. So awesome. that, this is a this is a podcast first. We've done we've done about this is episode number ninety one, I think, from the top of my head. We've done ninety one episodes and you're the first one from South America, so which is which is really cool. But you're originally Scottish, right? No, I mean I'm originally from the States, so I'm from I'm from oh, Vermont. From the States, the okay. United States. Uh, I was actually gonna say I know you guys are mostly a, a British podcast, but I hope the American accent doesn't doesn't throw anyone. <laughs> The reason why I said Scotland, because some people will be like, what, why are you saying that? It's because we were introduced <laughs> by a friend of mine who is Scottish, so I assume that you are Scottish, because um, he, he only has friends in Scotland, but apparently apparently not. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> shout out to Rod. Anyways, uh, Colin, I would love to talk to you about your brand, because, so, just for context, um, I get, and people know this, I get so many messages pretty much every day. I got like maybe three to five uh, requests to be on the podcast every day. And a lot of them are people claiming to have made millions and like loads of money from drop shipping. It's something that seems like a magical sort of like money pots where it's just like unlimited passive revenue, like for the rest of your life. And all you have to do is just set up a Shopify website, put some money behind Facebook ads, and that's it. You've made you've made a living from basically doing that. What I really want to talk to you about, Colin, is the process of setting up a drop shipping business that has done very well, in my opinion. Um, in terms of both the brand and operationally and also I want to talk about the honest truth behind it because so many of the videos that I've seen out there don't really tell the whole truth of running a business so would you would you think that's fair like it's just is it is it like a thing that loads of people talk about but it's just like it's not all real yeah yeah definitely I mean I, I think when you know I started Oysters Clothing um, with with my good friend Rod uh, I think we, we thought the same thing. We thought it was going to be passive income. Um, we're smart enough to build the brand and actually uh, make it take off. But what we've learned is it is much more of a learning curve than it kind of goes out there. Um, there's probably a lot of videos out there and a lot of people claiming, you know, get rich quick with drop shipping. Yeah, and it really. Is that. Um, I think there's a lot of pros and cons to it. Uh, I think it, it really works for us right now. It really works in terms of, getting a good proof of concept without putting a lot of um, large upfront costs. Um, but, you know, you actually have to market your product. You have to actually market your brand. So mm. what I always tell people, what I've probably taken away the most from this experience is it, it's building social media content first. Think of, think of your business as a social media content creation platform first and sales will follow. So it's really about building that brand and connecting with your consumers first and then the drop shipping will work for you. But people mm -hmm. that just think they're going to, you know, throw their logo on some clothing and they're going to start making tons of money with advertising, it's not going to work. You really need that's, to build That's what I feel like a lot of people think it is. And that's why I wanted to, to, to come on the podcast is to debunk these truths and to show the honest sort of reality of what it is to run a, a drop shipping business. Before we jump in, though, Colin, into, I guess, like the brand and everything, I would love to talk about, I guess, the operations side of things. And I know some people might be, I don't know, just just for just for ease. What is what is drop shipping? Just for people who don't know. Yeah, so drop shipping uh, essentially what it is is we don't, you know, oysters clothing. We don't actually touch any of the merchandise, and we don't actually ship it out. So anyone that's coming to our website and they place an order, that order is going to go directly to our manufacturer partner in California. They're actually going to do all the manufacturing, the printing, and they're going to handle all the shipping and logistics side. So it's very hands-off for us. We don't have to deal with any of that logistical side of things, um, you know. But but there are cons to the drop shipping model, obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Because a lot of people think they see these videos, and yeah, they just the, the, all the manufacturing side is is done by a third party, and they're like, all I have to do is get the orders, and I can get the orders from doing all these ads, and it's just like it's a recurring cycle, um, and the, and the the margins must be pretty good, and all that type of stuff. So. I guess before we jump into the operations side, what what gave you the ideas for oysters in in the first place? Yeah, definitely. So so oysters clothing. Um, we're, so we're our whole e commerce brand is based around national animals from around the world. Um, so for every new animal design we come out with, we're actually partnering with a charity that's actually going to give back towards saving these animals. 
So for example, like uh, one of our designs, the lemur is the national animal of Madagascar. So our charity partner, the Lemur Conservation Foundation, um, any of our lemur design t-shirts or hoodies um, is actually gonna go back towards um, supporting and saving a lot of these lemurs. So the whole idea kind of came about, uh, me and Rod, we've been good friends for about 10 years, met back in university at Washington State University when he studied there. Um, we've stayed in touch, been, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're big travelers. Uh, we've always, we both study business, so we both wanted to always work together. And I think when COVID hit, you know, it was really that perfect time where we were given a lot more time on our hands. And, you know, now's a good time to start doing something for us and really trying to build a brand. Um, so that's yeah. kind of where Oysters came about. And we spit around a bunch of ideas. And I think it really, the national animal concept really resonated with us from our travel experience. You know, we, we gained an appreciation for environmental conservation, actually a love of animals in their natural environment. So um, that's how we kind of built the brand. Um, and that's where we came up with the concept. What I, what I immediately love about that is that there is a immediate sort of value proposition there. Whereas you see a lot of like traditional dropship brands, they literally just have a logo on a t-shirt and they think they're going to sell loads. When in actual fact, like a big challenge is actually building that brand to like where it is right now for you guys. And you have to have a unique value proposition there. Otherwise, people don't buy into it as much. And for some, it, it is to be fair. Sometimes it is the logo looks nice or or like graphically it looks good. But I feel like what you guys have done very well is that you thought about that kind of from the first instance where, <clears throat> excuse me, where you um you knew that you could partner up with these charities and you could, you could be a, a, a source for good. And your USP was like, our brand is helping these charities and helping the raise awareness for these endangered animals. So it was a, a very good value proposition for like forefront and center. Um, so you already made a very good decision there, in my opinion, rather than just going in with the money idea first. Definitely. And I think, you know, a lot of people, when they're thinking of drop shipping, they, again, they think they're just going to create really cool designs and people are just going to fall in love with the designs and just, buy it based on the design and some people can do it that way but the majority can't you really need to start thinking about um what actually is going to to resonate with with your customer base why is someone going to buy from you versus a, a major brand like banana republic or, or something like that you really yeah. need to think of that that value proposition side so um and i think what we're doing isn't too too different from a lot of e-commerce brands you know a lot of e-commerce brands are partnered with one charity or, or they're partnered with a cause where maybe they're planting a tree for every piece of clothing that's purchased. That yeah. does build a connection with your customer base. Um, I think we took it a step further and we really wanted to partner with many charities. So when people are wearing their oysters clothing, like a polar bear shirt, for example, knowing that they're, they can have some customers can have some pride knowing that the, some of the money is actually going back towards saving polar bears specifically. Yeah, so that's yeah. where we kind of took a to its different level. But yeah, essentially, you do need a strong value proposition. You need to find an emotional connection that your customers can really relate to. Yeah, I mean, the way that I see it is that the drop shipping element that we'll talk about in a second is just the supply chain angle of building that value proposition, right? Like you, you've built that brand to where it is now. People want to get involved. The drop shipping element is just the way that you fulfill that need. Right, it's not the the core of the business, which I think a lot of people think it is. The core of the business is no different from any other business. It's just growing the brand. Um, so again, like we, I agree with you totally. It's you're no different from any other e-commerce brand that maybe buys their own inventory and sells it that way, the more traditional way. Um, so yeah, I, I completely agree with you there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Really treat your business really like the niche that you're going into. Drop shipping is purely just the, the, the vehicle that's going to get us there. You know, really, really, we enjoy, me and Rod and our whole brand, we enjoy giving back to these animal charities. We really enjoy relating to the animal community, people that love animals. So it, it it's easier for us to go about it that way rather than, mm. you know, make, get rich, rich, sque uh, rich, sque yeah. Scheme. <laughs> so Colin, you had the idea for oysters. You had the value proposition very clear in your mind. What was the next step for you? How did you build that supply chain in in like how did you build that supply chain in the back end? So how did you find the supplier? How did you build all the like assets and stuff? Because um, even though it's drop shipped, you have to have some sort of desire to make it good quality. And like there's a lot of other things that you have to control. 
So how did you go about like sorting out your whole supply chain? Yeah, no, no, great question. Um, going into it, when Rod and I were going into fashion, we thought we'd have to get a bunch of inventory on hand right away. Um, once we discovered drop shipping, it was a, it was definitely just a way for us to get that proof of concept out there. So the way we went about testing it is you're you're exactly right. Is we do lose some quality control um, going about the drop shipping method because we're not touching the clothing. So we tested a bunch of different suppliers, and I think. One of the advantages of Rod being in Scotland and me being out in South America, or sometimes I'm in the States as well, is we were able to test shipping methods, um, you know, in terms of how long is it going to take us to get clothing from, you know, a California based manufacturer versus a UK manufacturer. So you need to balance quality with also shipping times because that's very important. So we just essentially tested not only sweatshirts but a bunch of different um, print on demand providers, which one is going to work for us in terms of shipping times we're happy with quality that we're happy with. Cause we are a world brand where we're shipping to customers worldwide. Mm. So I guess more practically, how did you start searching for it? Like what websites did you use? Did you call people? Like how, what was the process? And what was also for anyone listening? What's the, what are the factors that are very important for them to consider? do your research like number one like really do your research like me and rod both kind of split it up like he was in charge of much more looking at uk providers i was looking much more at united states providers and when you go about choosing one think about what your market's going to be so we didn't know if we were going to focus much more on the the uk immediately or if we were going to focus much more on the united states so think about who you're targeting first once you narrow that down um, we tried uh, we tried a bunch of different providers. So um, Printify, Printful, Spod. There's a ton of different um, print on demand providers you can look into. I would go. A lot of YouTube videos out there are, are very very helpful. But I would really say you really just need to cast a wide net. Really do your research, and I think the most critical thing is test it. Don't just assume. Don't just trust reviews and think that this print provider is going to be the best. Because Rod and I thought we had one that was going to be the absolute best for us the reviews were fantastic they shipped worldwide in incredibly fast times um but then we got the product that we thought we were going to really like and they made some mistakes on it or the quality was smaller than we thought so do your testing and do your research mm. so there is a, a huge sort of like quality control element to it at first is like even though they might have amazing reviews it's like testing out whether they fit your demands and whether like you think your customers would like it is I mean, I think I think that's important for any sort of supply chain, but I think it's maybe overlooked when it comes to drop shipping for some reason. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, you really need to find something that not only is going to give you good quality, because at the end of the day, when a manufacturer screws up, which has happened plenty of times, it's your name attached. The customer isn't going to blame blame the the print on the man provider. They yeah, don't know you're yeah. using them. They're blaming you. So really find yeah. one that's going to cause you the least amount of headaches and really uphold your brand image. Mm. So when you when you eventually found your manufacturer and you were you were happy with both the so the quality, what were the other factors? So quality, time of delivery is also important. Um, I guess minimum order is probably important, but like you, with drop shipping, I assume it'd only be like you can do individual orders, so that's fine. Um, what other things are like other factors that were important at that, at that point? Yeah, shipping time is extremely important. Like, don't don't overlook shipping time. I think that was an area that I, me personally, I was pretty naive in the beginning. I was just thinking like, all right, we, we're gonna have the best quality from this print on demand provider. But people need people want things fast. So really think about your shipping time and make sure that's gonna be a, a high importance. You also need to balance that with cost. So you need to really think about is this cheap enough where I'm gonna be able to set a price where my margins aren't going to kill me. So you really, so it's a lot of different factors. So people think of this drop shipping magical formula, but you need to think about all these different things. Shipping times, is the cost going to work for me? Is the quality okay? Um, and, and is this going to work for my specific brand and market? What about um, like customs and stuff like that, Colin? Because obviously that's a, that's a hidden cost that, so you mentioned like they're not going to blame the manufacturer if they get a, a, an unexpected customs bill but they're going to blame you because like it wasn't a transparent cost. But so for it, like why I'm saying this is because we shipped it for my own business. We shipped an order to Spain and because of Brexit, they got a huge customs bill and it was unexpected to both myself and for them. And it made them go over budget. And now we 
might not have we might not be able to work with them in the future which is really annoying but so if you're doing on a smaller scale individual orders that would really annoy someone so how do you kind of like that's something that i guess do you consider that at all a hundred percent yeah you have to think about customs and we that was a big learning curve for us as well where people were ordering our, our manufacturers based in the united states some people were ordering these uh, across europe or something and you know they're their order was being held because um, they need to pay like an import tax or something like that. And, yeah, you know, we didn't yeah. know about that. So we're, we're suddenly like, oh, shoot, like we need to get this fixed immediately. Um, so what Rod and I have done, we've placed much more importance on we've acquired this customer. We're going to take care of the cost to get it in the country. So we think we're on a, at a place where we're just to try and acquire as many customers as possible and really give them a great experience. So while we're taking a hit, we're losing quite a bit in the profit margin we think the benefits really outweigh uh, the negatives there. But yeah, you do need to think about that. Um, going back to our, our beginning stages, when COVID was kind of at, at its peak last year, uh, we were getting all sorts of shipping restrictions. Uh, mm. A bunch of orders went to Australia, but then Australia would put up a new law where they're not taking any shipments into the country. So that gets thrown on us immediately. It's like, oh no, now we need to refund all these orders. And now we have all a customer service nightmare. But um that is something you do need to really really think yeah, about. yeah i i've actually watched a few drop shipping videos and not one of them have mentioned the hidden cost of customs i don't i don't yeah. really know why because that can really put a customer off um and i've only discovered that my my business isn't drop ship but it's the same sort of thing you're shipping out something to an international client and yeah they do get custom and it does annoy them it is because it's, it's a hidden cost people don't like that um colin i want to move on to i guess so you found supply you, you took all these considerations what was the kind of next step? So I assume it's probably building an e-commerce platform now, an e-commerce website. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So once once we had our, our our big idea down, we started contacting charity partners. We felt really good, strong about our designs. We signed on with some really good charity partners. Um, we, we got our drop shipping. We did that testing. We figured that out. The next step was all right. Now we need customers. How do we how do we get customers? And I think for a lot of e-commerce brands and ours mostly is it's based on your social media presence and really building your brand image online. So we kind of had to start at ground zero in terms of building the social media presence. But I think, you know, our unique selling proposition of going with all these charities worldwide really helped us in the beginning. When you, when you tag on to a charity that does have thousands, tens of thousands of um, tens of thousands of followers on Instagram and stuff like that, once you sign on with them and they start giving you shout outs and, it starts giving you some credibility, it starts giving you some credibility as a brand. So that really helped us in the early stages, mm -hmm. tagging on with some of these charity partners, really singing our praises and helping us out from there. But yeah, we had to start building that community online on Instagram uh, and Facebook in terms of finding these followers. Mm. Cool. Before we go on to the growth channel, so with the e-commerce platform, uh, e-commerce website, I'm assuming you would plug in the manufacturer onto your website so that once you once you generate an order, the order would just go straight to them. Um, so, is there any like difficulty when it comes to plugging in, or are the like I, I'm assuming you're using Shopify? Like, is it all like fairly easy to do? You don't need to explain it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shop, Shopify obviously obviously is a great great tool to use. Well, that is what we're using. Um, at the same time, you do need to make it look professional. <laughs> you you yeah. need to make a website that looks credible, and it goes back to what I was saying before why is someone going to buy from you versus a large chain you really need to people need to trust you within a couple seconds of going to your website so they need to find out in 10 seconds what are you all about and do i like what you're doing so going about building our website you know once we had everything plugged in in terms of the products and, and the print on demand drop shipping models all set up it was about really having good imagery very clear messaging um and, and reviews as well went went a long way Okay, so going on, going on to the growth channels now. So you mentioned um, you mentioned partnering up with different charities, and the reason why you did that is well to donate the money, but also they would promote you on their social media following, and then that would generate a following for you, and in turn it would generate orders. Um, has that been the largest growth channel for you guys? Yeah. So so Instagram, like a lot of e-commerce brands, that is kind of our strongest emphasis right now we really want to make sure our imaging is clear on there and we're building our brand that way um while the charity partners were a fantastic launching pad that can only take you so far 
they're not going to keep posting all the time for you or anything like that. So you need to go out and start developing your own relationships. Um, funny story. I mean, going off of that is in our initial stages, Rod and I would wanted to build the brand extremely fast. We were extremely ambitious and we wanted to build um, our following to an extreme, at an extremely fast rate. So Instagram, so we were like messaging a bunch of people, our brand, but we were using a lot of repeat language. Instagram actually suspended us for, for a couple of weeks because they thought we were robots. Oh, like damn. they thought we weren't, weren't actually, um, actually there fostering good relationships. So we learned a lesson right away that you need to foster genuine relationships on these social media platforms. So, and, and that's good. That, that is a good thing. And that is what we're trying to do. So we had to be more strategic in terms of who we reached out to, to grow these platforms and um, more strategic in terms of influencers to start building credibility. You can't mm -hmm. just spam a million people and hope they're going to start following you. You really need to foster genuine, genuine relationships. Mm, okay. So you, you had the charity partnership. So the, and the way that you get them is you would message them and then you would, in order to scale even more, you'd message influencers as well. Yep. I, I would say influencers was a, a, a strong, a strong way to get people involved. Um, uh, most people I think that are listening, they're probably going to go after family and friends first. We did that as well. We wanted to build up a little credibility in terms of following and in terms of engagement um, before going that route. But then, yeah, we tacked on the family and friends. Um, but yeah, I would say probably the biggest thing in terms of building your channels is you need to be active. You, you need to be engaged. You can't just post pictures and, and videos and just assume people are going to follow you based on your hashtags. You know, you really need to show genuine support in, in terms of following the right people and communicating with the right people. So it, it is a lot of work. It is a lot of work to build a channel. Um, and I sure, I'm mm -hmm. sure you've seen, you know, on our, on our, on our Instagram, it, it, we, we took it from, you know, very little less than a hundred people <laughs> um, up hovering around a, a thousand now. Mm, no, I, I have seen the whole journey and it's really interesting to see. And from, from what I've seen every time sort of an influencer or one of these charity partners promotes you guys you get a huge influx of followers like how many how many followers do you get i guess on average from one of these shout outs from both either the charity partner and influencer yeah so um on the initial stages when with the first post uh, of a charity partner we're, we're looking at 25 to 50 we, we have had one that that hit about 100 um wow. uh, but, th but then when, as you get influencers influencers is very hit or miss and, and one thing I'll say on that is really target influencers that are going to be appealing to your specific niche. So I think we learned that really right away as we were trying to go after travel um, influencers, and, and that was really producing very low results. We'd maybe get one or two followers, and that really wasn't working for us. So we had to shift models a little bit and go after people that are the animal lover niche. That That really is what we were, and we discovered that. Um, and once we started tagging on to people that are really passionate about animal conservation, environmental conservation, um, and people mm -hmm. who work in zoos and educating the public, those have been the most fruitful in terms of um, gaining us traction and building our, our community. Does that deliver you consistent sort of like traction and revenue growth? Obviously, we won't jump into numbers, but does that generate you consistent growth on like when you, when you partner with charities and when you do these influences? Or is it more a case of, you just have to continuously keep doing that. You need to continuously keep doing it because, you know, if you get one influencer, one charity post, people, people forget really quickly, you know, that, yeah. that it's not going to be a repeat system. So you need to keep finding new people, keep going after new. Um, this is where our charity partners, many charity partners really helps us, but having more influencers is really helpful as well. Um, I also think we're at that point where we're now expanding into our other platforms. So LinkedIn has actually been, extremely fruitful for us so while we just have about a hundred followers on there uh the linkedin algorithm is quite grand it, it goes to quite a few people so um, yeah, i yeah. would always think about you know which platforms you're going on to and now we're we're attacking uh tiktok a little bit and getting involved in that yeah i think tiktok for your brand would be amazing we had someone earlier on the podcast a fair while ago now but he has a clothing brand and he generates crazy amounts of traction just from tiktok that's his only channel um it, it's amazing so like I, I the power for that for a clothing e-commerce brand is is phenomenal um I, so i just want to oh yeah sorry go on no I, I was just gonna say i mean I, I think it is a huge growth channel we see a huge opportunity there because 
a lot of our competitors, our direct competitors in the clothing space, um, they're kind of doing what we're doing, where they're placing a lot of emphasis yeah. on Instagram and Facebook, but TikTok's kind of getting forgotten about. And, you know, clothing brands can go viral overnight, but also it just can, you can reach such a larger demographic with TikTok. So we're placing a strong emphasis on that going forward um, to really, you know, build our community, but gain a ton more traction that way. Yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, as I said, he literally just concentrates on on TikTok and he generates crazy amounts of sales pretty much every month now, which is which is mental. Um, what I was going to say, Colin, is that I wanted to highlight some of your answers before before we like to wrap up the podcast because obviously we talked about about it at the beginning of the episode where people think that drop shipping is a very easy thing, and you just mentioned how like you know building that brand is extremely difficult. I mean, it's the same sort of difficulty as growing a traditional brand, um, whether you do drop shipping or not. And talking about how you need to keep partnering up with different influencers, keep partnering up with different charities, and then like obviously you have to build all these different channels organically or organically, um, the same way you would another brand, like any other brand. So I love that you came out with that honestly because I know a lot of people just think it's so easy to do this, but I know about the amount of time that you put in and the amount of time that Rod puts in, and it's it can be good once you set it up because you're working on this full time and like it's it's a really cool brand now and you've grown it but it wasn't always like that and I know the amount of work that you put in so what are some really I guess the the key difficulties within growing this brand um obviously we talked about the operation side but more more towards the brand what's the thing that really stood out to you uh in terms of building the brand I mean you know you have to stay consistent on social media so I think in terms of as we've grown We've, we're, we're starting to get our, our foot into a lot of different things in terms of advertising, um, finding new charity relations and, and keeping up, um, you know, overall with the vision for the brand and new products that we plan to come out with and eventually maybe moving over to a different um, uh, shipping method going forward. But you can't lose track of your social media like that really kind of is the fuel to a fire with e-commerce brands. So I think really staying on top of that and being really consistent. So one cool thing going forward with that is Rod and I are actually bringing in, we just hired three interns for, for this summer, social media interns, some students um, that are going to be helping managing our social media platform. So we're going to be helping them quite a bit, but they're going to be helping us quite a bit in terms of the content creation, experimenting, but also really staying consistent because we really can't put you know social media on the back burner because it is such a, such a source for our brand. Amazing. That, that's so great. Colin, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been so amazing talking to you about oysters. Um, and I love, I've loved seeing the journey so far. And I can't wait to see what happens with it in the future. And I think this conversation for me has really, I guess, given a lot of clarity to the process of drop shipping. And I hope that people listening as well, same thing, because it's not easy. It, it comes with its own challenges and it comes with a lot of challenges that you would do when in growing another sort of traditional e-commerce brand. So Thank you for coming on the podcast and thank you for being so honest about your journey. I would, um, I'd love to stay in contact and I know a lot of people would as well. So how can people stay in touch with you and Oysters going into the future? Yeah, no, I appreciate, appreciate you having me on uh, to share our story. Um, yeah, if you, if you want to check out Oysters Clothing, um, it's at Oysters Clothing on Instagram. Uh, you can check us out on our website, oystersclothing.com. And we're available on LinkedIn as well. So my name is Colin McGraw. You can just send, drop me a message there. But check us out. If you like animals and you like um, giving back to some of these animals and saving these endangered animals, check us out. We, we'd love to love to see you. Great. Thank you so much, Colin, for coming on the podcast again. And I'm sure we'll talk very soon. Thanks so much.